So hello everyone, uh, welcome to the uh, session C. You know, like um, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Alex Nitner, who will be talking about cycle verification learning. Hello everybody, good morning. Uh, thanks for the introduction and the opportunity to speak. I'll present this work that I did with uh, this great team of collaborators. Um, Matthias Caro is around the conference, you've probably seen him already. Then there's Marcel Hinsche, Marius Ioannou, and Ryan Zwicke. Um, yeah, let's dig, di dig directly into it and start with uh, the motivation. So um, nowadays we all know the thing, everybody wants to have some AI assistant because we are all too lazy to code or write our emails by ourselves. And if you want to do all this by yourself, then there are several limitations like most of us don't have a lot of good data. Most of us just have a computer, not like a huge server room. And most of us have, I'm not so sure about in this room, but in general speaking, most of us have little expertise of coding these systems. Um, and in contrast, like they're the well-known big companies, they have a lot of good data, they have loads of compute power, and they, they have hired all the experts from the fields. So, um, Rather than trying to do things by ourselves, the natural solution is take some money and buy the service from them and be happy. Then, I mean, all of us have had the situation, I guess, going to ChatGPT, enter some prompt and realizing it makes some pretty bad mistakes every once in a while and sometimes more often than we wish to. So it raises the question, in how far can we verify whatever has been, whatever the learning algorithm supposedly has learned? And this question in the in the classical setting was raised um, in 21 um, by, by Goldwasser, Rotblum, Schäfer, and Yehu Dayo. And they wrote a paper on uh, interactive proofs for verifying machine learning, where they asked, can, can verification of learning be cheaper than learning? And which is sort of precisely the question um, at hand, because, well, if it, had, if it was Terrible price, then we could just do the learning ourselves. So, um, yeah, for, for meaningful notion of verifying that the service that we are accessing does the right thing, at least the cost of the verification should be cheaper than the cost of the learning. And in more detail, what, what they considered, or, or one particular setting they considered that is of interest to us here, is where the service oracle which we call OP for the prover, was stronger in some sense than the, the, the user's oracle, we call OV for the verifier. And this can be thought of as good versus bad data quality, for example. And the aim was to find some learning problem or set of learning problems where the cost of learning with respect to the user's oracle is more expensive than the cost of learning with respect to the service oracle. However, the cost of verifying with respect to the user's oracle is lower than the cost of learning with respect to the user's oracle. Um, now we are at TQC, so we do quantum. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, the same question will eventually arise in some unknown number of years when we have well working quantum computers and those fancy quantum learning algorithms that uh, people come up, came up with and will come up with over the next years or decades uh, are running on those quantum servers. Again, most likely many of the users won't have all this computing power, all this expertise, all the data. So we need some means of verifying these things again. So in this work, we ask the same question in the quantum setting. Uh, is there a learning problem or set of learning problems such that learning requires a quantum computer and quantum data, but verification is possible by a classical computer? And a quick teaser, the answer is yes. Um, exactly. A uh, quick side note, there are related settings like verifying, then everybody, well, people somewhat familiar in the field will immediately think of verified quantum computing, blind quantum computing, et cetera, et cetera. Those are related, but those are not the same. Um, that's all I say for now, but I'm happy to answer more questions uh, about this later or after the talk. Um, okay, 
Maybe we should have downloaded the slide. I don't know what happens here. I guess the verification did not succeed. I mean, I can't even exit the full screen mode. I'll download them quickly. Just a question of minutes. So that was the motivation. Um, let's go to through some preliminaries first, uh, so that you know what the words are I'm talking about later. Um, so to start, let's introduce agnostic puck learning. A quick overview. If you are not familiar with puck learning, could you raise the hand so I roughly know? Okay. Then um, let me let me introduce puck learning. So. Um, puck learning, puck stands for probably approximately correct, and the probably means that it's a like the, the task is a random random algorithm, there's a probability about success, and the approximate means we don't want to solve the task exactly, but only in an approximate sense, where which means like it's a learning task, so we have some, some concept class, which we call D here, of uh, instances, which some algorithm A is given access by some Oracle O, and it gets access to some unknown instance P from D. And then the algorithm interacts with this Oracle some number of times. And then after that, it's supposed to output a hypothesis H from some hypothesis class. And then the hypothesis is evaluated with an error respected, an error measure, which depends on some benchmarking class B. So here is like, Say this light green is the set of all distributions. Then we have a concept class, which is some subset of distributions. We have a benchmarking class, which we in general uh, consider to be a class of functions. I'll tell in a minute how to identify those with distributions. And then there's a hypothesis class, which is the class of outputs of the algorithm, which usually one thinks of those as, as functions as well, but uh, could be a randomized function, then it's a distribution again. So, um, yeah. And in general, like this delta n is the class, I, I use this notation here in the talk as the class of distributions over n plus one bits, where usually the first n bits are thought of as um, uh, one partition and the last bit is sort of an output partition in some sense, which you will see in a minute. Um, so what is this, this loss with respect to which we, we evaluate? So here we take, the, the classification error, which means we have some distribution over some x and y. And then we want some hypothesis that has as small as possible a classification error here. Really, if, if my p really is a distribution, so there is not a unique y for every x, then there will be always be some error. But um, there are cases where this, uh, like if this y is unique depending on the x, then this p corresponds in a sense to a function and then there can be a zero error. And for and the error, like here, this error of the benchmark class uh, is just the minimum over all the distributions in the benchmark class and the error over that. That's the minimal error in the benchmark class. Some quick words. Um, Okay, if you don't remember all of those, just um, so you roughly have an idea. 
if people pe speak about proper learning, they mean that the hypothesis and the benchmark class is the same, meaning this red and the orange is the same. Like the output is also what the stuff that with respect to which we are benchmarking the algorithm. It's realizable, then this, uh, then D and B is the same. So the benchmarking and the concept class is the same. If it's agnostic, those are not the same. That means that this will be non-zero. And this is the interesting thing and the stuff that we consider. And if it's fully agnostic, or that's our term for, for this thing here, we say fully agnostic if this D is literally the class of all distributions. And as I said before, like this, uh, yeah, we can identify a, a distribution on n plus one bits uh, with just its marginal distribution on the first n bits. And then the conditional expectation or the conditional distribution of bits that's morally speaking the same um, on the last bit, like conditioned on the first bits. And yeah, if, if this phi happens to be a Boolean function, then we even can identify this distribution with a Boolean function, which is what we mean here. Okay. Then a quick example. Um, probably also many here are, are familiar with uh, parity learning. So just to recap some, some things. Um, yeah, one common learning uh, problem is uh, parity learning, agnostic parity learning, which means we are given some samples from some unknown distribution. And the task or the benchmarking class is the same as the hypothesis class, which is the class of our parity functions. And the task is to find some parity that minimizes the loss. And if you think about this in terms of um, the, the conditional expectation value, and if we, uh, yeah, if, if you think of this in terms of the conditional uh, expectation value, and if we assume that P has uniform margin on the first n bits, then this just means that we want to find the largest Fourier weight of the conditional uh, distribution. And a quick observation, um, the distribution corresponding to the parity functions uh, in case of noise can be written as this here, which is then precisely the noisy random example oracle for learning parity with noise. And as such, this problem contains LPN, which is something we use in our uh, results. Uh, OK, that was agnostic learning. Uh, oh yeah, the, the rigorous definition. So again, here is the, uh, the, the graph, how the protocol roughly works. And like, yeah, usually we have a random example model uh, oracle. Then there is, independent of what algorithm we use, there will always be some probability. So there is some uh, requirement on the pr probability of success and the error. And um, so, yeah, in agnostic puck learning, we require that the algorithm with one minus delta probability solves the task where the task is to find some h which has at most this error. This alpha, if you're not familiar with this alpha, it's just another variable that you can put in there to make to have more control on how strict or loose the task is. Like for large alpha, the task is looser than for tight alpha. Like for alpha one, it's sort of the tightest. Um, exactly. And I think that's this because we're already at time. And now, what is the setting for verifiable learning? Again, we have a nice flow chart. It's a little bit more involved now, but not much. Instead of just one algorithm, we now have an interactive prover verifier pair. And like the prover and the verifier each have their own oracle. And uh, yeah, but they have oracles with, res with respect to the same unknown distribution. They interact with one another for some while, and then the verifier is asked to output either a reject, uh, either a reject in case he doesn't trust the interaction, or he outputs a hypothesis, which then has to, again, uh, has, has to obey some property given the benchmarking class. And the, there's a completeness condition, like in all interactive protocols, interactive proofs, that when P is the honest prover, then the, the, the verifier will 
with probability one minus delta at least, accept the interaction and return some hypothesis such that the agnostic learning criterion is satisfied. In contrast, the soundness condition then is for any dishonest prover that can be computationally unbounded with probability at least one minus delta, V either, return, either rejects or it returns a valid hypothesis. Then with that, let me tell you what we found out or what, 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 what our contribution was. So first of all, um, we wanted to do quantum learning in the agnostic puck learning regime. And um, yeah, so we need some meaningful quantum oracle for this. And usually in quantum learning, people consider the, in quantum puck learning, people consider the um, quantum puck oracle, which is, uh, that one is given copies of, of this quantum state. So for a distribution, this is the quantum puck oracle. For a function with respect to some distribution over the inputs, that is the quantum puck oracle. And this oracle is, is great for function like functional agnostic, by which I mean that the concept class is a class of functions, not of general distributions. Um, yeah, if the concept class is a function class, then and one is working over the uniform distribution, then this Oracle is great, one can do Fourier sampling, et cetera, et cetera. But it's not clear how this is for the distributional case. It's, it is not known that it's hard from, for the distributional case using this Oracle, but um, it is not, straight, not a straightforward way to, to reduce to the previous, like to the functional case. Um, if you write down the Fourier thingy things of, the, of this Oracle, then you will end up in a confusing mess. So we introduced a new oracle. I was motivated by some old work in the computer science um, where we identify with, so first of all, we, we write our distribution again as, um, as a, a marginal distribution and the additional distribution. And then we identify our distribution with a random function family, which is defined uh, such that, yeah, this is the definition of the random function family which you can think of as like it's a, like this line essentially just means for every input, uh, yeah, for every X, you randomly, according to this conditional distribution, sample the value of the function. So that gives you the, the random function family. And then the, 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 yeah, the mixtures of superpositions oracle, as we call it, then is this quantum state. Yeah? So instead of just having a pure quantum state, we have a mixed quantum state and it is the, so this quantum puck oracle often is also called a superposition oracle and we have a mixture of superpositions with respect to all the function families, in, functions in the random function family. And yeah, with this oracle, we then were able to show some nice things. So first of all, um, in the distributional agnostic quantum puck learning setting, so we're not yet doing verification, we're just doing the learning. Um, we've, yeah, exactly. There we found a number of theorems, just put them all in here already. So first of all, we, uh, we, we could show that there's a quantum algorithm that can efficiently approximate samples from the Fourier spectrum of phi. So we could efficiently do approximate Fourier sampling where the approximation depends on, um, on some details, but it is good for the things we want to do afterwards. It's not exact, that's uh, crucial. I mean, it's not crucial, but it's sort of a crucial limitation. Um, and with this approximate Fourier sampling, we can do one agnostic parity learning from or any distribution, and we can also do two agnostic Fourier sparse learning um, from any distribution. Uh, then for the verification, unfortunately, we cannot verify this for all 
distributions, but there's a subset of all distributions on which we find that, um, uh, yeah, that distributional, that, that the, the corresponding learning task is hard for classical learners. Yet we can efficiently solve it from um, an interactive protocol of this uh, type of sketch before where the uh, quantum prover has access to a random to a, to a mixture of superposition oracle and the prover has either uh, statistical queries or random example access. And the same thing for two agnostic uh, Fourier sparse learning. So, so um, yeah, this already gives you gives us precisely the separation that we were looking for, a task of learning where classically the task is hard to learn, but in an interactive protocol with the quantum prover, we can verifiably solve the task. Um, however, there are also limitations to our nice mixtures of superpositions oracle. So what I said before was all that the distribution class was always had uniform marginal. And as soon as we drop the uniform marginal, as soon as we go to the distribution independent case, similar to other results in quantum learning, uh, I note, we find the, the limitation that um, for the agnostic learning, the task of agnostic learning using mixtures of superposition, the query complexity is still lower bounded by the VC dimension of our, our uh, benchmarking class. So this is um, sort of the same lower bound as in the learning concept, uh, learning settings. And for the verification, this is quite a nice uh, bound we found that in the distribution independent setting, the verification is bounded by the square root of the VC dimension. So there can be an improvement for the verification, but it will only be quadratic. This is very much uh, similar to the um, to the work by I think it was the Wolf and others about the quadratic speed up in quantum learning that for distribution independent case. That's the best you can hope for. Um, okay, well, how is the time doing? Okay, then I go. Uh, directly to the discussion. So to overwhelm you, a large table of results that you can find in our paper. And let me just add some open questions that may be interesting for some of you to consider. So of course, this mixture of superposition oracle, it's a cool thing, we can do cool stuff, but it's, to be honest, we don't know whether it's efficient. Um, or if it's just the uniform distribution, then one can efficiently prepare it because it's just the all plus state. But um, in general, we have no idea whether there's some uh, efficient way of given some efficient to sample from distribution, how to efficiently prepare this, this oracle. Um, then, as I said, there are no known results for the agnostic learning setting given the, given the standard Puck oracle, quantum Puck oracle. So it would be interesting to know, is there a separation or are we just too stupid to obtain uh, results. Um, then in a, one can ask about verification in a broader sense. Here we asked about verify as classical. So what happens if we allow both sides to be quantum, but one side is resource constrained and stay tuned. There's upcoming work in the next, I guess, two, two months uh, with a bunch of more results. And obviously, as always, the question, is there some NISC friendly variant of verification? Because all I said here is, probably only in 10 to 20 years, if at all. Um, <laughs> with this, um, thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to taking your questions. So like uh, for the all the results here, they're all for just a uniform distribution. Um, the so so the lower bounds are for the distribution independent case. Um, it's, I mean, I'm I must admit I'm not sure whether one can get 
it's possible, but I'm not sure whether one can get the same lower bounds if even restricting to uh, the marginal being uniform. The upper bounds all had the restriction that the, the marginal is uniform, like the marginal on the first, uh, on the first n bits. But I'm pretty sure one can relax this to like product distributions that are at least so and so uniform, like that have at least that are that are not completely biased. That's sort of similar, like more or less the same should hold as in the typical function Fourier sampling setting from quantum puck queries. Thank you. I hope that wasn't too confusing. <laughs> I um so I'm wondering uh so my question is more for the classical verification of classical learning probably yeah. but would it make sense to consider like uh maybe a, like a zero knowledge kind of proof for learning is is this some like a notion that would make sense um it is a notion that makes sense and um this is what is going to be in our upcoming work <laughs> um in, in, I mean in particular in the quantum setting this is something you can do if you have quantum interaction, like uh, quantum communication, then you can <laughs> then you can apply uh, uh, verification of quantum computing protocols to do precisely this, and they under the hood rely on some zero knowledge things. Um, the classical side, I am, um, yeah, they they that, like in in the Goldwasser paper, you will find uh, the at least one result that does precisely that. Like under the hood, they don't explicitly call it like that, but uh, they do that, yeah. And I just small. So, are there like cryptographic consequences? Like, could one derive like, okay, if I can verify these kind of things, then this happens in cryptography, or vice versa? Um, it's it's a question where I admittedly I don't have a concrete answer, but I um, I can tell you what my rough understanding is. Like, um, I think that. The main issue in in transferring from learning, like like the the, the results from learning to cryptography, is that in, in learning all we do is with respect to some oracle, and it is very dependent. And, and in cryptography, we want something that is of a computational nature, usually. So this is sort of the gap that is to be bridged. And often in learning, the the efficiency or inefficiency has to do with the Oracle being able to provide you data in a certain representation or not. And um, this is, I guess, the, the, the bottleneck. Thanks. And, and let me advertise tomorrow, Thursday, I also have a poster on another project about learning, but not the verification of learning. But feel free to also ask their questions about this one. <laughs>